Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here in Uruguay in the 16th Congress of the Latin American Association of Systemic Functional Linguistics. And we're here with people that are very knowledgeable about systemic functional linguistics from Latin America, Venezuela, the US, Chile, and more. So the proposal for today is to invite you to explore the role for linguistics in a moment of collapse in a social, economic, health, and political way, the way that linguists can find solutions and understand the moment we're living in. In 1992, Halliday gave a speech where she proposed that the world was changing just as today. And in that moment, the quick change made us realize of how symbols and semiotic changes are present. She proposes that this theory is developed based on these changes and the theories have to develop answering to different challenges and the changes that are happening right now. That is why the people that are here in this Congress are linguists that are characterized by developing practical and linguistic theory that talks about how linguistics has to answer to reality and that the academics have to act based on the things that are happening today in the world. Today we are inviting you to see the challenges that we have to face today and the ways that we can face them in different ways. As teachers, as linguists, as people that can contribute to this problem and try to transform it. First, we'll listen, listen to James Martin. He's a teacher in the University of Sydney, Australia. If you see the web page of this Congress, you can see the complete information about the speakers, and I won't take more time to talk about it when you can check it online. After him, we will listen to the Professor Adriana Bolivar. She's uh, one of the most important teachers about systemic social linguistics from her university. Then we have Virginia Zavala, also important in this region in the world to, to talk about social linguistics. Then Professor Ruth Harmon from the University of Georgia in the United States, who is originally from Ireland, but works with the migrant population of the United States. And the Professor Teresa Teisa from the Universidad Católica de Chile, who has been working for many years in aspects about in systemic linguistics. So we have an amazing panel to start thinking about how we can answer to the crisis of the crisis we're facing today. So now I'm inviting James Martin 
everyone will have 20 minutes to speak. And in the end, we will all have a moment to ask questions. We invite everyone to ask through the chat in YouTube, and we will share them with the speakers. Thank you. Thanks for having me, and thank you, Mariana, for all your hard work, and Laura. I know these things take a lot of organizing, and been missing you all terribly, not being able to travel and see you for the last couple of years, so nice to see your faces, at least all of you. Okay, I'm going to share my slides now. <clears throat> okay, thumbs up, successful, share, you can see? Perfect. Yep. Okay. All right, so I gave myself this title to talk a little bit about um, what role we can play in a changing world and to help change the world, which we need to do. Uh, second slide here is just a reminder of the little quote from Halliday that gave the name Appliable Linguistics to a range of theories that um, try to promote uh, a theory, description, practice, dialectic. So I won't read it out. I think we're familiar with the idea. And um, this is the sort of orientation that I want to take today, which is trying to make sense of what it actually means to um, enact appliable linguistics and what kind of challenges and successes and failures have I experienced. And it's nice to have the chance to look back at this stage of my life to um, what I've been involved in. So thinking about appliable linguistics in general, I think from the 20th century, we saw the development of two major appliable linguistic theories. And their gurus would be the American linguist Kenneth Pike and the British linguist Michael Halliday, working in Michigan in the United States, essentially, and working in London in England at the birth of SFL. Kenneth Pike, of course, um, a missionary linguist. A uh, little quote from him there, I wanted a theory that would allow one to live outside the office with the same philosophy one uses inside it. So a nice opposite way of characterizing applied linguistics. And I put a little picture of his sister Eunice there working in Oaxaca, Mexico, uh, as part of the Summer Institute of Linguistics um, missionary work there. And on the other hand, we have the Marxist linguist Halliday. Uh, and I have a little picture of him there working in Northwest China in 1948. I think you can pick him out among the Chinese colleagues that he was working with there, Chinese comrades, I should say. And a quote from him from Bernstein I learned also for the second time in my life. I assume 1948 was the first time that linguistics cannot be other than an ideologically committed form of social action. So it's a very interesting complementarity, radically different orientations. Uh, Pike's group, of course, determined to bring Christianity to the world, to civilize the world in that sense. And Halliday's project, a rather different one that I think about in terms of redistributing cultural capital, cultural values on a more reasonable basis around the world. Their famous books by Pike inspired an incredible amount of language description and has a very, very global orientation in what it tries to do. And then an inspirational work of Halliday's where he works uh, looking out as a grammarian to try to paint his work in a, in a larger picture of things that we're all familiar with. I think what's interesting is standing back from these appliable linguistic theories and think what's shared, what's shared about them and how that in a way distinguishes them from many other kinds of linguistic theories that evolved in the 20th century and continue to be uh, practiced now. For example, a very strong orientation to meaning uh, rather than form, a very serious consideration of text uh, rather than just the grammar of sentences and phonology, uh, an understanding that you have to have some kind of model of context if you're going to make sense of text, uh, a very serious account of multimodality that there's more to language going on in semiosis and communication. And then that all means that you have a very, very big theory compared to many other models. And so one important um, property of both these theories is this notion of a fractal 
approach where the same kind of ideas for Pike the tag beam, which the name of his theory comes from, and for us, our system networks, uh, these ideas that you have a tool that can be used over and over again, whether you're discussing language or images or language and context or whatever you're working on, uh, you can use the tool over and over. So however you come into the theories from whatever direction, because you're interested in appraisal or genre or education or whatever, the tools you pick up early on are tools you'll be able to use over and over again in your work. And in Halliday's case, we know the kinds of things that were inspired from his um, account of English grammar, uh, which then radiated out in all kinds of different directions for the analysis of different things and application in different spheres. In my own work, I've worked in three main appliable contexts. At the beginning of my career, I worked with psychologists and psychiatrists at a psychiatric hospital in Toronto studying the discourse of schizophrenic speakers. And then later on in my career, uh, when I moved to Australia, I became involved in educational linguistics and trying to think how to redistribute access to literacy um, more widely and democratically in schools in Australia and then around the world. And sorry, I skipped over one, which was the forensic linguistics work, uh, which we worked on diversionary justice and youth justice conferencing. So it's interesting to try to think about the impact of this work in terms of changing the world. I would say in terms of the <clears throat> clinical work, we did have some influence on a very small number of psychiatrists in terms of understanding the basis on which they diagnose schizophrenia listening to the language and what is it about the language that characterized thought disorder and non-thought disordered schizophrenia. But as far as patients are concerned, they're treated with drugs, not with therapy. So really no impact in that way. As far as forensic linguistics was concerned, we, I think, came up with some interesting ideas about why conferencing works and how it could be improved, but no bilingual forensic linguists emerged to actually design and promote change from that project. Educational work was more successful. We have brilliant educational linguists continuing to emerge all around the world. But I should say, looking back, that the success of our work is very, very often dependent on good luck of having good supportive management higher up around us in various sites around the world. And I'll come back today. It's one of my themes for today, um, why that's important to focus on, because it's not something we think about a lot in our work as semioticians and linguists. So I'm going to back off a little bit now and present a model that um, of life, the universe and everything that I worked out with Rob McCormick uh, a few years back now. Rob McCormick is an adult educator in Australia. He's uh, a philosopher and his specialization is rhetoric. And he's someone we've worked with on and off over the years. And we were thinking at this time when we were in dialogue about how we would map the resources that students need to get control of uh, through all various levels and sectors of education and came up with a map, first of all, of social practices, uh, sort of domains, if you like. Domain of knowledge covers the various ways in which we go about understanding our world, how we build up folk and more or less scientific theories of the world around us, including its physical, biological and social organization. And the domain of identity covers the various ways we go about understanding ourselves, how we appreciate and position ourselves as members of smaller and larger communities, talk with others about what, who we are and what we do. And domain of regulation covers the various ways we go about controlling what we do, how we organize ourselves and others to get on with their lives we live together. So a model of that kind, then. Just a way of dividing up genre families to think about it from an SFL point of view. In modernity, this one sort of realm of our experience that we live in so much of our time now, knowledge is built up through science, used to construct technologies that work back on that environment in large scale mechanical ways. 
identity is constructed on a large scale, typically on our behalf through public forms of narration, a novel film play with which we're expected to identify and critique, the expert appraisal with which we are expected to affirm. And regulation manifests itself as administration involving a hierarchy of governmental and bureaucratic enterprise that rules and conditions our public life with the humanities and social sciences responsible for developing the understandings used to manage large populations of citizens, employees, students, and confined subjects of various kinds. So we might think about it in those terms. Now I just wanna to signal today that we do a lot of work, our community on knowledge, discourses of knowledge and discourses of identity but I think relatively little work, or maybe in many cases, no work on the field of regulation for interesting reasons. So let's just think about regulation a little bit and review some of the work that's been done thinking about that realm of experience, because as I said a moment ago, the success of so many of our applied projects depended through good luck on having sympathetic regulation that would foster our work just by good luck, okay. What do we know about administrative discourse? Uh, most of the research comes from a project in the early 1990s, uh, which you'll be familiar with from work on media discourse and academic discourse, maybe not so much for its work on administrative discourse. And Rick Edimer was the head of the team that worked on the administrative side of things. And uh, that's the report from the research project uh, that was done in the early 90s. And then Rick carried on and did work in um, administrative discourse uh, throughout his career, but gradually left a social semiotic approach and moved to a more of a managerial discourse kind of approach over time. And in the early work, he thinks about administrative discourse is um, three big families of genres. A uh, family he refers to as guidance, which is provisions about how we regulate ourselves, uh, a realm of surveillance where we keep records and monitor the success of our provisions, and a rule of directives where we have to, uh, as things are changing, actually control the behavior of the people who are subjected to governance. And if we think about these things, all very radically under-described, I think, in terms of guidance, plans, mission statements, goals and outcomes, role specifications, personnel structure, duty statements, procedures, manuals, routinizing task, protocol, policies, regulations, all kinds of work to be done there, whether it's how do we make regulations clear to people who are going to travel to Ireland and worry about having a drink in a pub, what is that relationship to the actual legal statute, statutes, how do we make this knowledge accessible to people, all kinds of interesting work to do there. Down in the realm of surveillance, of course, we have all our pro formas, list tables, forms, descriptions of states of affairs, recounts, historical recounts, accounts, you know, reports that we make on how the governance is going, noting trends and patterns, bringing graphs and statistics into it to monitor. Uh, this is important in terms of making changes since when we want to make changes, and it's obvious from our work in education, it's no use saying something works. You have to be able to prove with numbers that what you're doing works in terms that make sense for higher up in the admin, something that's been very challenging for us over the decades. And then finally, we have the directives, which we all experience perhaps more directly. And you've all perhaps had all kinds of memos over the last two years about how you're meant to behave, coming from higher up in your institutions, changing all the time, do this, do that, behave in a certain way at this point in time. And the directives, of course, are a genre with a particular structure that um, organize our lives on that basis and generally make us exasperated and frustrated and feeling resistant and um, all the things that we feel, which, um, maybe is part of the reason we don't really go and study this kind of discourse. We prefer to kind of put it out of our mind, if you like. In that regard, I put a little quote by Halliday here. A newly evolving register is always functional in its context, whether the context itself is one of consensus or conflict. The language may become ritualized, but it cannot start that way. 
because to become ritualized, a feature must first acquire value and it cannot acquire value only by being functional. So we need to keep in mind that the administrative discourse, like every discourse, evolved to be functional in a particular place at a particular time. Now I'm gonna intersect this a little bit in case my discussion of modernity has been making you a little bit nervous. And this is to introduce another of Rob's ideas about the different realms of life that we live in, moving from vernacular to institutional to global, reflecting living in a kith and kin world and then having to live as well in a world of modernity and then now live in a world of post-modernity. So we live in a postmodern world which evolved out of a modern world and a modern world that evolved out of a pre-modern one. We say that one world evolves out of another, we mean that a culture reworks the things it did before in a way that has impact on the way in which people live their lives. It's not just that a newer world replaces an older one, nor that a new world springs up alongside an older one. Rather what happens is that a new world emerges as a recontextualization of an older one our past stays with us, but we can't live it any longer in the ways we did before. And we refer to these recontextualizing phases of life as realms. And I think we all move through them in our own lives ontogenetically, just as our culture has moved through them phylogenetically. Five minutes, Jim. Okay. The oldest of the realms is the vernacular realm. It's our realm of kith and kin, okay? resources developed through life among family and friends. And the institutional realm is the realm of science, technology, business, and government. We need to go through to function in public spheres. And then the global realm, the realm of worldwide communication networks, the web, innovations in workplace management, the quality control team, multimedia techs, intertextual reading practices, and so on. And their attitudes to Difference is one of the most important things to keep in mind here. Being different in the vernacular realm, taming difference in the modernity realm, and negotiating difference in the global realm. And that has implications for thinking about what we want to do. So looking forward, what kind of agendas would I accentuate? So first of all, I think we need much more attention to governance to understand it functionally, what it's good for, how we can make use of it and how we want to change it. So if you don't like bureaucratic admin discourse, think of it as a kind of know the enemy, okay? So we need much more research in that sphere, which I think is incredibly under-researched. Then there's the whole question of persuasion or epideictic discourse. This is one of Rob's uh, main things. What do we need to focus on as participant observers, like involved and analyzing what's happening uh, in the vernacular realm, the realm of protest, but um, protest we can survive in the institutional, the realm of democracy, how we can make it work for us, and the global realm, the realm of diplomacy, how we actually reconcile difference, if you like. And then in terms of subversion, a couple of things to think about. One is how do we get ourselves more involved in management? Our disadvantaged schools program was heavily dependent on by good fortune, having a linguist in management above us. Another success story in Australia, the Adult Migrant Education Service, same story, someone trained in linguistics, managing them. Queensland Department of Education, same story, linguist high up, all through good luck. And we can't depend on good luck. We have to somehow arrange for us, our students, to be more involved in admin, even if it means sacrificing our academic career, because we need those people to foster anything we want to do. And then, of course, there's the organization of things, the thing we can do to organize ourselves. I just put some obvious examples here, the Primary English Teaching Association in Australia, uh, the Reading to Learn, organizations around the world, Lexus Education, our own linguistic organizations, all things that work bottom up and take advantage of governance to work that way. 
it's interesting. There's all kinds of things to learn from watching the Battle of Chile. But one of the most agonizing things is watching the socialists fail to negotiate with the anarcho-syndicalists. So top-down socialists trying to deal with bottom-up anarcho-syndicalists and it all becomes a big mess and sort of subverts the whole project. So we have to learn to cooperate top-down, bottom-up. Keeping in mind, it's not just about us and our differences anymore, but about reconciling with our planet. I don't know if you know Aaron Stevens' work, but I can recommend his as part of a growing eco-linguistics movement around the world that we need to become part of. Okay, there's another quote from Halliday on Applied Linguistics. Never mind, and um, that's what I'll leave you with. Um, as positive discourse analysts, we need to become participant observers across these spheres. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> I need to stop share. I'm going to stop sharing now. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Jim. Perfect timing and a lot of uh, questions, reflections, and also some strategy on how to approach this work. So thank you so much. Uh, and now we'll move on to Adriana Bolívar uh, from the Universidad Central de Venezuela. And um, I will share the screen for you, Adriana. So let me know when you want to. Right now, yeah. Okay. And uh, I have to say, I'm going to. Bien, mientras pones eso, quiero ganar tiempo agradeciendo. While you start presenting, I want to gain time and thank you for the invitation to present today. I feel honored and happy to be here with, with you, my colleagues. As time is short, the topic of this Congress is the linguistic in times of crisis and to be I'm going to talk about linguistic and the crisis of democracies in Latin America and dialogue as hope. I'm going to cite some of his words. We have to cooperate up bottom up and top down. That's a problem that we have and dialogue as hope is a hope to obtain information and ideas to promote communication. Why I'm focusing on this? In front of a systemic collapse, one of the biggest challenges that linguistic has is to contribute in front of the crisis of the democracies and to the dialogue democratic dialogue in crisis. The key words are cooperation and conflict. We have cooperative dialogue or conflict dialogue. Dialogue as hope because if we cite philosophers like Kohn and Vasquez or Ball or Arendt, dialogue and rule of law present us the biggest hope in this crisis to participate in a democracy that favors plurality. The problem is in preserving this public dialogue and the, and the truly political action. We have to present politics as a human activity. This was worn by Arendt many, a long time ago. Arendt was no doubt one of the first thinkers in point, uh, pointing out the danger of interrelation, the monologic power in the different system powers. 
including democrat, liberal democracies. For her, the absence of public dialogue implies the suppression of citizen participation and so the absence of true, true political action. And we have this challenge to know how can we contribute. Systemic functional linguistic has contributed a lot in this. And for the ones who are starting, it is important to know the different levels in it, which has its um, It has helped in from a perspective, social semiotic, as Halliday's mentioned. Also in the different functions. In an interlevel, we have discursive semantics by Martin and White. That is another level of analysis, and it's important to have them clear. Then in the discourse level, like where Sinclair, Hoy, Bolivar, Hanston, and Thompson, we have different patterns on how Texas are organized. If we think about Europe's critical studies, we have Fairclough, Cress, Water. We have in Latin America, Oteiza, Atugar, and myself. And there are some free lines that we have to start filling them up with new ideas and keep contributing to the to systemic functional linguistic. For example, resistant grammatics. And we have to start thinking about the different problems our countries are facing. So I want to make the following reflection. And I want to share this with you. The contributions that SFL can make to uh, make the quality be, uh, better between the speakers in the social dynamic is important. And for that, I am for active speakers, I mean people. And also we have to revise the concepts of Bajian dialogue and the concept of appraisal in the different levels. As we all know, and we don't have to say much, for Bachin, there are two concepts of dialogue, real dialogue and that is the alternance of speakers taking turns. And we also have the representation of dialogue that is the one that we most study, the voices in text, the imaginary representations. As he himself said, there are one between speakers, when we see alternancy between the discursive subjects and we see a representation, a convention representation between the discursive communication and the communicate discursive communication uh, In words of Voloshinov, he also says this, we have the notion of dialogue in the narrow sense of the world and in the broader sense. It's important to examine this. What does it mean narrow sense? And what is the meaning of broader sense? For us as analysts, it is important to insist in dialogue with alternances. Because in this kind of dialogue, as Bologinov says, is all the responsibility of political change. 
In this type of dialogues, we see people and personalities that move dialogue and they are the ones who are in charge and are in charge of the different representations and the vision that is broader sense. Because of that, I think it's important to discuss this because they have important implications, this difference. The implication of difference between broader and sense is that the first one we have speakers, people, real people talking in real context and we need an answer to move dialogue. If there is no answer, we don't let the other speak. We don't let the other be. We don't let the other think and not be, it's important. We have so many problems of monologues and it's fundamental to listen to the other. And also this kind of, kind of dialogue definition let us know who controls the evaluations and the appraisals. Who decides, who, de who follows, that's fundamental. On the other side, on the representat representation of dialogue, The, the focus is only on who is analyzing, who are we analyzing, the representation of whom. There are so many implications in this. And we are following the ones who are initiating the dialogue. This is something that Mariana also does. She was talking about this in the conference. Now, if we go to the notion of evaluation and appraisal, we have to talk about the different analysis levels and the perspectives the different perspectives that we have is different to, to know which of them said. And we have to compare them and it's a compromise that we should do. Compare the different perspectives and see how can we use them in our favor, all of them. When we see evaluation discourse, motivation is we have motivation to change, to an interchange in text, in editorials, and how we organize the information in that stage of discourse. Also, we can see it in social change, is what I have been working with from some time and the value who starts and does the closures. This is not something that is done in, a, in an empty space, but it's done by people. That's why I'm interested in this. Only six minutes. If we are start, we extend the application of batching and bulletin of in evaluation. We see different categories of analysis, dialogue, change, evaluation, text. I want to go to the next slide. What is the meaning for me to study the focus of these in people. The political actors to put responsibility on them, it's important. 
In this, we can see that I, a few words from the president of Venezuela. It's interesting. Behind these columns, there, are, there is a lot of interaction, a lot of answers from the media, from the church, from the society, syndicates, and more. The interesting thing is that we can think that democracy, we can think that is representative democracy, but once you study, you realize that all the cases of democracy are along with revolutionary democracy. We can see how it start being in Venezuela from a dialogue of authoritarianism, the revolution. I have to refer uh, to this local situation in Latin America. Uh, Venezuela had alternative of parties, political parties. They had, they could talk. In the 92, we had a, a we had a coup d'etat and Chavez start the presidency in 1998. And he was ruling until 2013 when he died. Then we can find after all these years, a contraction of dialogue where PSUB assumes as the dominant party, we go, Maduro assumes the presidency and we go from one side to the other and we go to have one of the biggest crises in Venezuelan history. We had the dialogue crisis in Venezuela. We had massive migration A lot of people migrated during this time. It's a situation that the government is presented with a lot of violence and is accused of violating human rights. There is no separation of powers. What we need is dialogue. We need only that. I'm going to say my conclusions. Social and political change requires change in the way of addressing a problem and creating awareness. How do we get so awareness through dialogue? The role of all the participants that speak, we have to take everyone into account, politicals, the military force, the media, universities, church, the role of the church in Latin America is huge. The role of people in the street, and we have to know and see the responsibility of those who start, follow, and decide in micro and micro interaction cycles. And finally, we have to see how dialogue and the evaluation of interaction in the political crisis. I close with my compromise as linguistic to strengthen dialogue, how to teach others to speak, to dialogue, to, to love each other and to make them sit and talk. The last table to negotiate was in Mexico that Venezuela had and Venezuela didn't dialogue it. It wasn't, a, it was, a decision wasn't taken. We have to keep hope in cooperative dialogue and offer new tools, more from a perspective of inter and multidisciplinary perspective. 
a perspective where linguistic interacts with other disciplines. It's already been, do, been done, but we need to focus more on that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Adriana. This is also about how to deal with the difference of the many answers. We have and how can we interact with people that are different to, to how we are. We'll continue. with Professor Virginia Zavala from the Universidad Católica del Perú, who will share her reflections about what linguistics can do in these times of crisis. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I would like to start thanking for the invitation of participating in this seminar. Sharing with people who have contributed so much about this, about systemic fashion and linguistics. For many years, I have been teaching about this grammatical model in some of my courses, and also I have used it in my investigations. But I confess that I have never felt part of systemic fashion and linguistic practitioners. Even though my initial studies haven't included systemic fashion and linguistics, I later incorporated their differences, their different contributions to my practice. And I was realizing that it greatly en enriched the way in which I thought about language and I worked with it. I believe important to point out the former so that what I will share will be understood completely. In this brief presentation, I would like to say that in these times of, of social, economic, health, and political collapse, linguistics and systemic fashion and linguistics, and also language studies in general, have a great opportunity to, co to constitute as a critical field that integrates contributions from different theories developed within the discipline and also social sciences. As the webpage from this conference says, the work that the linguists are doing is socially implied and it depends, demands a commitment at ideological level, even more in this context of collapse. To me, the way to do this is to opt for a critical and interdisciplinary perspective that not only enriched from other perspectives, but also contributes to other perspectives and disciplines. After all, the empirical study of language always reveals social and cultural processes. In other words, language is always a way of empirically analyzing the dynamic of social life. As a social linguist or as someone who studies the language in society, I can't stop having a posture that is clearly political and in favor to social justice. However, I'm also aware of the way that sometimes, many times, from academia itself, we have been and we continue to be complicit with making differences and it result, results in the reproduction of inequality. That is what I mean with the necessity of reflexively monitoring our proper, pro, our, our own processes of investigation. Halliday's model was clearly one of the contrib main contributions to one of language social theories, along with others as variationalism or Heim's communication ethnography.
It influenced decisively in other theories that are more contemporary, like linguistics anthropology. Also, Halliday's social semiotics and systemic functional linguistics had an impact that was crucial in critical speech studies. It offered a strict grammar with semantic orientation and clear linguistic categories to analyze the, the relations between speech and social meaning. It also had an impact in different approximations to interaction analysis. In writing approaches from perspectives that are sociocultural and in the study of language, in educational processes in general. Over the last few decades, the studies of language and society have been characterized by a, by a use that was every time that was sophisticated and by a con and by an understanding that was The approximation of potential that language studies can achieve. There are other theories in language studies in society that also have put the notion of power in the center of their investigations, like criticism in social linguistics, glottopolitics, linguistical anthropology, literacy studies from a perspective that is sociocultural, and others. I consider that semi-fashional linguistics can be benefited a lot if it is articulated in a way that is more organic with social cultural linguistics in its different theoretical currents, which in many ways they share, which in many ways share subject matter between them. A social cultural linguistic, by that I mean, and I am referring to a coalition with interdisciplinary bay for the studies of language, culture, and society in broad terms. From the start, Halliday was aware that the production of meanings and the social world is mutually, mutually related and that the relationship of language and social system is not only a relation of expression, but a more complex natural dialectics. It's complex because it actively symbolizes social systems creating it and being created by it. Even so, I think it's important to point out the necessity that analysts, that language analysts would try to adopt as a theory of culture that is more sophisticated. Social life as an articulation between material and symbolic constitutes a field of power where language plays a central role because it contributes to the production of sense that fabricate this social organization. Power is the strength and control that has power and the strength that it has to control and to impose and the ideologies as mechanism through which power is set, constitute social formation and are invaluable for the existence of any society. I would like to point out two ways in which power acts over, 
linguistic resources and the way that they relate to study objectives and the ways and the questions that investigation does in sociolinguistics. Blomer distinguishes the powers through language and the power in language that should be complemented in the study of language and society, but however, they are often analyzed in study fields that are different and don't have a dialogue between them. Blomer's proposal is that we work both dimensions to make, to be fair to the complexity of language study in society. In one way, power through language is, happens through the way that we combine what we say as part of discursive practice that are specific, and we set propositions to build versus the reality and to relate with others. On the other side, power in language is, is happens in the way we construct our own linguistic resources that are later the basis we use to produce linguistic difference and social inequality. From the studies of language and society, linguistic resources are studied as part of development of practices, of social practices in specific contexts and not as objects that are isolated from their, from their production processes, from their distribution and from their social consum consumerism. Pointing this out implies studying the language as a, an activity and not as, an, as a structure, as something that we do, and not as some, a system that is autonomous, as a material moment in social life and cultural life, and not as an abstract entity. Practices are not only the things that we do or the use of language, but activity that are central to the organization of life, social life, and they are ideologically defined, reflected and constructed in power relationships and different ways of social life. As Bourdieu reminds us, practices are actions in history which are in charge of articulating material world with symbolic world. In, to say it in, to say with other words, social life is filled with different types of practices, educational, religious, recreational, etc. And linguistic practices are a type of practice that are always created from others. From systemic functional linguistics, we know that language has evolved to satisfy the needs of humans and that those characteristics must precise, precisely are due to the uses that it has had. Those uses, however, are part of the ideology that it is part of, and they cannot be explained without talking about the relations of power in society. Assuming the notion of practice influences the fact that the object of study is no longer languages, structures, or texts, but processes and practices through which subjects produce texts, representations, identities, relations, or 
social relationships of linguistic resources. The linguistics characteristics that we find in different genres, in different text genres, and that we analyze are a product of the actions that people, in the way that they are, that people do, the actions that people do in the way that they are influenced by power in society to reproduce conventions, but also by the agency by which they negotiate with the expect expectations that are built in society. So in conclusion, I believe that in these times of crisis, not only is there a need of starting a dialogue beyond the frontiers of our sub area, but also beyond academy, as we do in many of us. Language, produce, language produces social life and it constitutes a concern for a wide spectrum of professionals in different sectors of society. To achieve this, we need to establish alliances, develop a project that is critical and non-hegemonic to rescue the subjects that are actives behind the text that we analyze and challenge the notions that are established by language that sometimes are not helpful to visualize a life beyond crisis. I had an experience that made me realize how this is going to be useful for the tour. Thank you. We can see here how these patterns start to appear in, this, in different institutions and they help us make a dialogue between the people that create the situations. Now we introduce Ruth Harmon from the University of Georgia who will share her critical perspective from the point of view of systemic functional linguistics. I, I'm very honored to be here on this panel. Um, I think it's, a, it's such a wonderful exploration in this very difficult period of time. Um, and um, I'm going to share my screen now, um, hopefully, <laughs> and get started. So just give me one minute. Can, can everybody see me? Everybody, excellent, okay. So uh, um, hopefully I, I, you know, I think I've got my time on.
happen and, uh, you know, what's going to happen in the years. So who and what are we working for is the question I'm kind of addressing with this. Um, and I see myself more as an activist scholar uh, working, um, you know, in kind of a praxis uh, connecting theory and prax practice um, all of the time. Um, so that's kind of um, where I am with this. Um, uh, sorry, sorry. Um, oh yeah, here we go, sorry. So uh, in of um, Del Himes um, and, um, um, you know, who was, who was mentioned already, um, I kind of go, go back to Del Hines because Del Hines kind of um, encouraged us as qualitative researchers and ethnographers to really be thinking about how, how we in develop relationships with participants, with students, with whatever community we are in. Um, and um, um, he stresses in his construct of ethnographic monitoring uh, the importance of listening and following the emic perspectives, perspectives of the participants and their communities, and in making sure to research, research issues that participants of a study are invested in pursuing, and making sure that the findings from research benefit the participants' communities. Um, and so I wanted to kind of draw on this to uh, start thinking about SFL and the work, uh, the praxis we are trying to do. And I, I emphasize the trying. So um, also uh, I wanted to um, um, you know, refer to Suhanti Motha's um, article in uh, 2020, um, you know, in terms of appealing to us to really be thinking about uh, what what we call if we call work culturally responsive or culturally sustaining what exactly are, does that mean and who is doing the analysis and um who is uh you know explicating uh, minoritized groups language practices so kind of reflexively thinking about these issues um is an important thing to be thinking about in our work um, and also um, uh, on a macro and micro level, um, the, the push in neoliberal institutions like mine, very much a neoliberal institution, there is this push to publish. And if you don't publish, you lose your job. Um, and this goes against the kind of the slow work and the slow research that we need to do in um, in in in. Uh, in contexts with minoritized communities. Um, and the irony is, is that a lot of times we're benefiting from the publishing and researching on participatory approaches uh, what, where, while community participants remain entrapped in discourses of poverty and racism. And I refer back actually, like Jim was talking about the whole need to pay homage and to you know, notice what's going on on an administrative level. Um, so it's kind of important for us to really be thinking about how do we make this work? Um, how do we enact this work um, in socially accountable ways? Um, so um, as uh, Matheson and many others have pointed out, um, SFL praxis is steeped in kind of an ethnographic approach to linguistic research. We're looking at language use as a pliable resource uh, configured differently you know, across time, registers, and socio-historical contexts. And so something very important then to be thinking about is when we're doing our research with community is to be thinking um, of how we are engaging with the communities that we work with. Um, so, for example, and Blamert uh, talk about the need to really gain information in collective ways, collaborative ways uh, with communities that we work with, um, and also reflexively thinking about our privilege, our social positioning, um, and our research approach um, in the work that we do. Um, and so, you know, I kind of just appeal to us all to be kind of thinking about these issues at this point in time, since it's uh, 
such a, you know, a time of collapse in many ways. Um, I wanted to also kind of highlight the, uh, the fact that there's a whole legacy um, in SFL education and linguistics, an extraordinary amount of work uh, that, and longitudinal work that has been uh, done by Jim Martin and colleagues, by, uh, by Maria Brisk and colleagues, by Mary Schleppergrell and many others who have spent years developing collaborative relationships over long periods of time. And then through this uh, relationship building and through the, um, the kind of the, the unions and you know, um, district relationships, say for example, in Maria Brisk's case, th there emerges the space to do critical genre work. Um, and so, uh, so, so, so this tradition is very much within our world. So our pra praxis oriented method responsive to goals of the local communities is something that many have done. Um, and I'm kind of like using our work to kind of question whether how I'm doing it just to kind of think aloud about this whole approach. And so um, Mac Halliday and also uh, Christi Christian Matheson talk about social accountable linguistics as a potential mode of intervention to address issues such as racism and social inequity. Um, and um, uh, I think Jim had a quote in his from, um, from Mac Halliday uh, in terms of appliable linguistics. And so I think it's very connected, the appliable linguistics and the social, socially accountable linguistics. Um, so today I want to uh, take a journey with you um, through some of the work we have done and uh, to question and look and see if our praxis uh, can be seen as socially accountable in its inception uh, design and research approach and how we can keep thinking through our work um, by taking this framework um, and uh, using it. So, um, uh, you know, reflexively, uh, I just want to talk about my own positionality. At, I mean, it changes all the time, but in some sense, my subjectivity coming from being Irish uh, coming from a colonized country um, and coming to the United States and being positioned um, as um, very favorably because of my white skin, my Irish na um, nationhood and my freckles. So, uh, so there is a whole uh, positioning, uh, positioning of, of myself in this work and that I need to keep on thinking about and interrogating as I go forward. So uh, some of the work that we have done um, in the last, since 2016, we're, we're, it, there's, an in, uh, there's an, uh, kind of a stop at the moment because we're not able to be with the youth in the schools at the moment. Everything is kind of closed down. But uh, the, the, the aim of this work, our culturally sustaining systemic functional linguistic work, is to support youth in... Uh, in, in expressing their visions and um, their arguments for, uh, for, for, for new and better communities where they live and play, live and uh, where they live and go to school. And we use multimodality and also a critical genre based pedagogy to support this process. We have uh, worked in, th in three different areas. Um, and I just want to mention these because, you know, kind of then I'll be thinking through them. Uh, so we've worked in after school and in school with high school students, pre-service teachers and adult um, allies um, working and using a arts based um, SFL approach uh, to support their visions. Uh, we've also worked in summer schools. And also we opened a, a community center art program um, and that has closed down. Um, and we'll talk about that in a bit. So uh, the framework that, uh, that we use, um, or we, you know, we say we use, and we're going to be looking at this and questioning it, 
but uh, is we we say and and we always work together. So the, so there's no really I. There's always a collaboration when you're working in, with this kind of work. But one thing is is to provide and support our learners through uh, through a very language rich multimodal environment with lots of different material and um, semiotic resources that they can use um, and develop and draw on to start arguing for uh, their particular vision of a different um, a different version of school or community. And we also are supporting them, our aim is to supporting them in the designing to, uh, to develop expertise in the use of expository genres, argumentation, explanation, descri description, and also to foster a critical semiotic awareness among our youth. So this is kind of the, the, the purpose and the kind of the theoretical kind of framework that we use, drawing from uh, Mac Halliday and also Dango Paris and Sami Alim, um, um, in, in, in doing this work. So uh, this is just, you know, a, a kind of a demonstration of some of the work we've done uh, in multimodal composing and kind of use of genre uh, argumentation, uh, starting where students are at in terms of storytelling and photography, and then moving into mapping, drawing and building designs um, and introducing whatever genres the students will need for their arguments to high stakes audience for them, maybe perhaps in front of a, 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 the school principal at times. And we've also had city council members as audience um, listening to their listening to their vision and uh, sometimes taking on their vision and making some changes thereof. The whole purpose is for youth to see language and other modes as social action, um, you know, so that they see how it functions. So, uh, so how do we do with this work? And so this is kind of like the reflexive part. So um, I said in the, uh, in the framework that we provide this language rich environment and uh, multi we, we try and support a kind of a very multimodal and multilingual environment um, to support people in, in drawing on, uh, you know, kind of on, on, on active designing. Um, and, uh, you know, from an equitable, from a socially uh, accountable praxis perspective, I think we did, uh, the work that we did was in, in, in its inception, very much related to socially accountable work in the sense that we had done uh, a lot of work in the schools and had done some ethnographic, you know, uh, kind of um, participant observation of the schools. And so our work with youth emerged from that. So that was kind of uh, very socially kind of kind of connected to social accountable kind of um, SFL praxis. However, uh, the fact that we use after school spaces uh, where English only ideologies and hierarchical relationships of adults and youth are still there can be quite problematic when you are taking a participatory approach um, where you want to disrupt these, um, these, these, these very constricted kinds of relationships that we experience um, in, these, uh, in these school con uh, contexts, especially for minoritized multilingual learners. So this, this is an issue here uh, that we need to just kind of hold. This is the tension. Some of the work can be, is, has been very successful in supporting our youth in seeing themselves as civic leaders, but at the same time, there are constraints. So whether we're doing what we say we do is not necessarily the case uh, uh, there. The other- Five, uh, the five minutes, Ruth. Oh my gosh, sorry. Okay, wow. Okay. So uh so so the another tension is um is uh when we went to the community, when we started working outside schools and went to community, uh there was a there, there was a there was a big issue in terms of we did not have now I can say this after we did this work, we developed a whole CSF SFL program for a community center. 
Um, and there was uh, there was huge tensions with uh, the housing authorities. And uh, essentially, our failure came from the fact that we had not, uh, we didn't have enough ethnographic understanding of the community practices. We, we, we were very familiar with the school and the school practices, but we were not familiar enough with the culture of the community practices. And so we have had to take a step back from that. So it was a kind of a definitely a learning experience, a painful learning experience. And then very quickly, um, since I don't have that much time, um, also research wise, uh, you know, we've been using um, SFMDA to kind of explore the multilingual and multilingual processes of our youth. However, our work has not been longitudinal at this point. And so in some sense, uh, the research cannot really uh, support uh, teacher educator curriculum or youth curriculum um, until we can actually establish a more um, you know, a more longitudinal systemic uh, program. Um, and this is to do with funding um, and to do with funding, you know, and, and other things. Overall, um, in, in, you know, our town is one of the poorest counties its size in the United States. We have high poverty. Um, and uh, essentially we have done some work. We have been successful in some ways, but we have not uh, contributed to any tangible changes in the in 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 um, in the conditions of our community, and so this is something that, as as a socially accountable linguist, um, I need to keep thinking and questioning. Um, and so I think that my my am I, Marianne, am I out of time? One minute. <laughs> so uh, so essentially. Uh, very important in this kind of work is for us to include members of the community every step of the way. Um, we need to uh, develop a deeper on ethnic ethnographic understanding of the practices of the communities we're working with. Um, and uh, we need to continue reflexive exploration of our failures and uh, in redesigning our work. Um, so uh, thank you so much for that. Great. Well, thank you very much, Ruth. Eh, muchas gracias, Ruth. Eh, vemos acá también temas que reemergen, ¿verdad? La idea del, del compromiso y la, eh, la idea de est estar, rendir cuenta socialmente de, del trabajo que hacemos y la reflexividad como un espacio a desarrollar a nivel profesional para seguir mejorando eh, el trabajo que hacemos, ¿no? en diálogo con, con los actores, con la comunidad con la que trabajamos. Entonces ahora invitamos a la profesora Teresa Oteiza de la Uni Pontificia Universidad eh, Católica de Chile, que va a compartir su experiencia y sus reflexiones eh, para seguir pensando cómo responder desde la lingüística a, a la crisis sistémica. Gracias, Teresa. Gracias, gracias Mariana. Y voy a, voy a compartir pantalla. Ahí se ve. Bueno, muchas gracias, Mariana. Eh, muchas gracias también, Laura, eh, por esta invitación y y por poder compartir ¿no? en este panel, han dicho cosas tan interesantes, valiosas, eh, espero también poder contribuir, creo que hay muchas, muchas, ideas, que, uh, hay muchas ideas que ya se han planteado. That have already been said, but we have to keep working on them, and it's a pleasure to be here. The title of this reflection dialogue between SFL and the studies of this course. And I present here some aspects of this dialogue that has been held between decades between 
investigators that are interested in the studies of this course and the theory proposal of SFL, which consider language as a theory of human experience. Social reality nowadays still challenges our practices as analysts of this course. Our investigation need to follow strict standards and they need to contribute to transforming reality, not only in a more equal, equal place, but also in a fundamental way. And they need to give sense to the social context of our countries and our sub-communities. In this presentation, I'm going to present two questions. The first one, what is the meaning of making study, of doing studies of this course from a semi social semiotic perspective? And what is, and why we, do we need to give a critical perspective from a hopeful look? A semiotic theory recognize the purpose of theory of language and social activities to take a stance and consider some principle and the way this can transform our social practices. Among these principles, I want to talk about the fact that it's a practice, a social action between subjects that are constructing, constructing human experience. This construction implies historicity of discursive trajectories uh, with intertextuality between different points of view in dialogue between the productors and readers and language and society have evolved together and are from Halliday's perspective, the same thing. I want to stop here to talk about two fundamental aspects from my perspective as a discourse analyst. What do I understand from critic and why do I consider necessary uh, to have a transdisciplinary perspective to study discourse? Texts are understood as a taking into account this proposed by Halliday and that language brings things into history. The potential of language is inside of it. This means language is connected with all the experiences of human life as they exist re material reality and meaning. We can combine the different kinds of meaning, interpersonal, iterative, and textual. And as analysis, we use them in every instance of a communication. As this course analyst, our question is of social char characteristic. For example, asking ourselves of the ideological standing of our memories, personal, family, social, and how they affect the process of remembering and forgetting a recent past and the national, a national conflict. We explore the, the patterns of meaning in the discursive practice. And that means asking ourselves about production, circulation, and reception of text. A critic posture as an analyst of this course implies having a compromise in society to be more fair, no racist, non-sexist, and it means having a 
ethic and ideological posture as investigators. This means that we need to look for, for things and we need to look for different ideologic perspectives, the ones we don't share. And we have to look for examples and to show the different postures in life. Those are sexy, those are racist, and those who show inequality. These critics makes us work in this. As O'Grady says, we need to take into account everything and it's not, that is not a fail. We can compare these to some history teachers from Chile that, that are accused of doing and having a political posture in class. When they talk about the class dictate and, taking, and from taking students to the Museum of Memory. This is study about human rights is seen as a leftist political stance. And being as an analyst of this course, it means that we need to defend our position as linguists all the time. I consider an exploring the different practices from the SFL semiotic social linguistic theory involves not only study, we need to study everything and study the different type of discourse, alternative positive and those who celebrate difference. As this orientation We, we now not only look from top down, but we also look for bottom up when talking about discourse. And we look at agency from an individual and group and community perspective. We construct memory together and we see pa the harmful past of human violation of rights. The changes in social life that connect the personal memories of, of death and with the community memories and the school texts that have been published in the last 30 years, let us analyze, analyze the dominant discourses and the politic of the pedagogical politic of the country. On the other side, if we take a reconstructive analysis of this course, we can know who, who takes part in this discourse, the study, the history teachers, the students, when we analyze the class interactions with the teacher and the students, we can see the ways in which students and teacher challenge and participate the memories and the knowledge. They build different ways of taking part of social society and how they perceive their personal and social past.
we can analyze the way these are these let we can get to know these different spaces of this curse The critical studies of this course in their Latin American trend have recognized the importance of a transdisciplinary look. Linguistic is required to dialogue, to have a dialogue with different disciplinaries. This has been worked from social psychology history and many other uh, studies from many other places in the world as well. These different studies reset the different types of discourse. This allows us to analyze in different ways discourse not only in a semantic level, but also how they are realized in a lexical grammatic, grammar way, genre and everything from another point of view. Despite that, the theory from other science, social sciences place are fundamental to address the different levels of interpretation and to explain how this course, how this course work and to understand them as social practices. In consequence, we need to combine an, a linguistic analysis with a, a multimodal systemic analysis with other social disciplines. The way of looking at and the context is aligned with working with a transdisciplinary, in a transdisciplinary way and looking at different stages of investigation that from analysts of this course. In this way, I also consider that this course analysis and the interaction with history class is really important. Many of the contradictions and the tension between teachers in, in their alternative positions from the official ones means that they have uh, means that they have to work with memories, with the memories of the country with more, more light, and they can contrast the two spheres, for example. In the case of students, this can also be more clear as many students don't talk in class, they don't write, they, don't, they only listen and think. For the same reason, we can analyze the way they interact, not only in a reporting stance, in a micro practice, reflecting together and what about what others say. Perspective of oh, semi socio semiotic perspective looks for significant meanings from a social, for meaning that is built and with motivation. This leads to practice from a privileged look and putting focus on real people that talk, that dialogue more than in the text as the language of use. In the same way, in this way, we need to understand the position students have and how they perceive after the social revolt in October 2019. The critical studies of this current Latin America have 
focus not only in an analysis that let us allows us to understand what is bad in the world, but also what is good and who is doing a positive change in our societies. To finish, I want to say and focus in the relevance that this can only expand, elaborate, and be more complex, but they should do, do be so in a collective work of reflection and application. As a SFL community of Latin America, we need to, we have done important development and we should be doing so. We need to keep moving in a relevant way in our educative projects. We need to be partner aspects more partners even. Thank you. Thank you very much, Teresa. Now we have a few minutes and we're going to use 10 more minutes. I know Virginia Zavala needs to leave, so I hope that you can start first. I don't want to use the time, I want you to use it. There are many ideas as well repeated. And many of you mentioned the idea of monitoring our own work. We need to keep moving. to keep transforming our societies. You have given different ideas. One of them is, for example, how to have a productive dialogue despite difference and how to generate hope in a context where it seems that people are not listening and how to intervene. So, I don't know who wants to talk now. Let's try to start talking among us ourselves in a bilingual, multicultural dialogue with people with us that we have, we are we agree in many things, that we have different ideas in how things can be approached. Virginia, do you want to start? You have to leave. I think we have agreed in many things. We talk about ethnography. We've talked about the same experts on the subject. We've talked about ideology. I would like to think about it a bit more and I invite anyone that would like to talk first. I do think that we have shared many points in common. Ana, ¿verdad? El tener la oportunidad de respuesta o... <laughs> I have a question for Ruth. Where is she? What went wrong? You didn't really tell me what... Yeah. What went wrong with the what went wrong with the housing commission? Why couldn't you what what was the tension there? The 
wanted us to be much more kind of, um, you know, kind of a homework club and um, evaluation and assessment. And so our kind of participatory type of approach, you know, where we wanted to do art and kind of multimodality and get the kids thinking and, you know, kind of presenting on their views was very counter their whole way of positioning um, those who were living in 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 the in government housing, and so uh, so so there was the, and and so Jim there was you know the way but like it, it, it if we had I mean you know I mean of course you now is time to to do it again because now we know more, but we we weren't aware of how rigid the kind of the divisions were. Um, and so, so that led to kind of an impasse at one point. I mean, it was amazing how difficult. It, I mean, you've probably been there with work that you've done in the past, but so that was the that was the problem. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> okay, then I'll go ahead. <laughs> okay, first I wanted to thank everybody for 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 the, your presentations and all you taught me, because there's a lot I have to learn, a lot of, lot of things I have to go deeper into. And I'm very, very happy to be in this panel uh, because I've learned from Virginia, for example, I would like to go on talking about how you work with communities or, or with Ruth, for example, because I, I've been thinking of that possibility in my case, and I see it so difficult. How could I? I'm an immigrant. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I don't live in my country. I don't live in Venezuela. I live in Mexico. So how could I do? What could I do at a distance? That was my question. And this is the position of many, many lingu or many colleagues who are, you know, not in the country now. So that is a very difficult situation uh, for you as, as a linguist to do something from, you know, from outside, not being in. And, and that is what, a question we ask ourselves in a group we have on migration or a group we have, you know, or, or, or things we've been doing on xenophobia, for example. And what can we do from outside? You know, and that is a very difficult but real question. You know, I would like to hear suggestions, please. <laughs> mm, difficult, eh? Sorry, okay. Somebody else was going to talk. Yeah, Ruth, can you help me in that? <laughs> and I think I kind of, in, 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 you know, in some sense, I, I was kind of impressed with um, some of the work that uh, I think his, his name is pronounced Ah uh, and Blomert, you know, the work they did in, um, in Belgium, where mm, they... Blomert, Blomert. Uh -huh. Blomert and, you know, Ah, uh, you know, in the sense of, um, working collaboratively and almost like being house linguists, like they were like ethnographers, so they were in of the community. And so I, I think in some ways we, we can't do it from outside. We can only do it if we kind of develop like these relationships. And I think we can very much. Um, yeah. and, you know, and then it, it's very slow work though, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, yeah, yeah. I wrote down what you said about building relationships, and I think we have them. But the difficulties to work together are, are very big. But anyway, I think I will, you know, follow that idea because it's good and have projects together. We, we can still manage to, to communicate. So that would be really good. And I may, I will probably, you know, call for help. <laughs> call for help. I look for you. Or yeah. Virginia to see, you know, what we can do to help. Because the idea is to is to to, to strengthen dialogue. You know? People just don't, you know, it's like two different worlds, two different worlds. You know? And 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 the thing is how to bring these worlds together. Yeah, and that I see that as a very difficult task, but not impossible. I think we can do it. We do it at an academic level, you know, but not as activists, not as activists. And I think that is missing in our case. And, and it is very important what you've done or what you, what you are doing actually, you know, going in from an ethnographic perspective, I think is something we have to learn because we haven't done it, you know. I say we, we have groups outside and we, all we do is talk and analyze the situation, but we, we don't do much with analyzing only. 
So we need to act, you know, and for that we need the experience that you, the experience that you have, you know, and that, that will be really important for us. Yeah. So I will appreciate it. <laughs> Any exchange of, 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 of articles and, and experiences, that will be really welcome. Thank you. Creo que algo que surgió también en I believe la... something that appeared during the presentation was this about positioning ourselves and responsibility and putting ourselves in the paper in the role of the academic and intervene without feeling guilty and and doing it strategically like to infiltrate in certain spaces and support certain groups and potentiate the working class. But this is a compromise in a ethic level. Is it necessary? Not that it wasn't done before, but nowadays, should we be more risky? Yes, I do. I do believe that. Can I say something before I go? I think that basically we try to approach a reality that is getting more and more complex. And now we need to broaden the things that we do when we work. Try to apply theoretical frames that come from other places. Use other sources when we work like Teresa was mentioning, a series of things like observations that James was mentioning. And I think that not only the methodological, methodological amplitude has to be considered, but also investigate about others or for others with other people how to investigate with others genuinely dialogically and how we can question the categories we work with that sometimes are not enough to approach a reality that is so complex and sometimes we cling to these categories like they are absolute truth when they aren't and we realize that reality has to dictate these categories and these lenses we have to work with. That's what I wanted to say. I completely agree. I think we cannot marry two fixed categories and we have to build them according to what reality is telling us. We have some questions related to this. For example, how would you see the cooperation? Would that mean that participants could be vernacular, as Shim said? That's one question. Let Jim answer. It's a question from the chat. Could you just repeat it, please, Mariana? Um, how do you visualize cooperation? Would that mean particular vernacular participants in a broader global context participating in a global? Vernacular participants, what are those? I guess I can only relate that to the context I've worked in, like restorative justice context. I mean, 
we were actually like trying to study the diversionary justice processes. And of course it includes the victims of the crimes. It includes the young offenders. It includes the police persons and the conveners and support persons and all of that. Um, but, you know, we were just working on an observational basis as participant observers and then trying to theorize what was working, what wasn't working. Um, the key always to making a change is to get these bilingual people you call like educational linguists or forensic linguists or, um, you know, psychiatric linguists or whatever who are bilingual between the two things. You need someone who can mediate between the people who you're trying to help and the theory people who are working in a different kind of level. And if you don't produce those bilingual people that are very clever, the Joan Rotheries and the David Roses and those kind of people, if they don't step up in that kind of, you know, bilingual mediating kind of position, then nothing is going to go anywhere. So um, I suppose one question is, how do you foster the kind of people that can really do that kind of negotiation? What kind of training, what kind of support do they need? And just remember that above all of this, as I tried to emphasize, is all of the governance that's sitting on top of everything we're trying to do. It's no point trying to dialogue with people if you don't take into account like who is managing them and governing them in all realms of government, whether we're looking at administrative departments or politicians or city councils or what it is, they're all sitting there. And we tend not to look up and think about how can we manage up. And we've just been in all our successes, depending on good luck. We had good luck, we had people helping us, or we had bad luck and people destroyed our work. We're at their mercy and we can't afford that. We can't afford that anymore, so. Yeah, but that, there's a, how do you reconfigure, como se reconfigura y se transforma Ese mundo y esas prácticas. How do we transform this world and these practices without losing our transformation ability? If we start participating in the institution, the institution eats you. And the institutional logic is more powerful than an individual trying to transform the world. An individual can have a short impact. The strategies of getting alliances, the government, how how can you achieve dialogue to push together and get alliances and not only try to infiltrate in institutions, we have seen that they destroy an appropriate of these different spaces of transformation. A good theory like SFL is a kind of vaccination against that kind of thing. Of course, you're going to have to compromise practically to change things, but your theory should always be there as a vaccine. Yeah. <laughs> I would like to add too that it's also connected to how complicated it is right now for us to move in the spaces we are moving in the university and the demands that it has. Like Ruth was saying, the demands that we have to produce, it's really complex. It's a practice that I value along with others that are outside of the university, with our own students. And there is where we have the space. that is fundamental, especially if in our universities there are more and more students that are first generation and the space has been opening for studying, which has been an incredible challenge for us.
but also an opportunity. Yes, I believe that having again the, the classroom and the collaboration with students in our investigation practices and action in the world outside, in the real world, connect and need these practices as part of our actions that are collaborative with the different actors. This is something that Ruth said of building relationships and links that held in time, held that held in time and if we go in and we go out of the time the impact is not longing and also we lose impact and trust in our own work we, without it without this compromise and the effect of this compromise and if you had to say in one phrase something that gives hope to this idea of dialogue as hope and how to build an agenda that pushes linguistic to respond to the demands of this moment, what would you say in one phrase to, to close up? We said it at the beginning. We need to learn how to cooperate, as Jim has said. That's what's most difficult, how to cooperate. I would agree to that. I would talk about collaborative work, making teams with different levels of information. That would enrich us, open our minds, and the things that we can see outside of our categories with the help of other investigators and other students. Maybe using linguistics for people, for speakers, and for transformation. Just like that, going outside of classrooms and looking at communities and people. That's very important. And not only staying in university, going outside, outside of this environment to speak with people, which is probably what's more, more difficult, but not impossible. Several people from the panel talked about this is the, um, the the transformative types of spaces that there are because it, it's difficult for us, I think, in this period of, you know, such crisis to, you know, it, it's easy for us to kind of look at what's going wrong, but looking at the potential spaces, um, as, as Teresa was saying, inside the university itself, um, you know, can can really can really open up. So holding the hybridity um, seems hopeful for us as linguists and scholars and activists. Jim, do you want to say something? No. I'm fine. I'm finished. Okay. Well, bueno, muchas gracias a todos. Thank you very much to all of you. These leave us with some questions and ideas to keep on thinking about the, the job we do and about the following meetings we are going to have. I thank you a lot, the panelists for participating in this discussion. Also to Romina Gargaglioni that interprets for us and Lucia Valeri from IPA that also is helping with that. 
I thank also Nicolas and Carolina from the Unit of Communication. And I invite you to join us tomorrow at 9.30 from Uruguay. We are going to have the conference of Silvia Pessoa that is going to be joining us from Qatar. We are going to see some other experiences, another perspective from a totally different context. Also thinking about this way, a way of transforming the world and society. So thank you very much. And we see each other tomorrow.